So now um, we we'll continue with uh, Chris Mergertreit. He's um, at the Manchester Metropolitan University, and I think his talk will nicely add to what Vanya already said because he's now uh, going to explain how epigenomics can be investigated in animal models. And as far as I remember correctly, you will also go into detail, especially with anxiety and depression, yes, yes. which will also be super important for us working with human models. So, yeah. Chris. First of all, yeah, I'd like very much to thank Thomas and Axel for the invite. Can you hear me? And also for the organisers for putting this together. Uh, first, also uh, apologies for bringing the Manchester weather with me as well. <laughs> These white clowns just seem to follow me around wherever I go. Um, so I'd like to talk about the translation of animal models of epigenetics, hopefully tying in to the previous presentation and um, some of the work of, um, um, of Thomas as well. So the whole idea about this is that you can use animal models in order to test hypotheses that you can um, derive from studies in, in, in uh, humans. So for example, if you find certain associations in humans, you can develop ethological animal models to test that. And vice versa, things that you find in animal models can then inform hypotheses that you can also test in humans. So I'd like to show some of the work, the recent work we've been doing by bouncing these two um, sets of results and hypotheses from human models, from humans into animal, into animal models. So particularly focusing on depression and, and mental health, obviously it's, it's, a, um, it, it, it's a massive problem at the moment. One in six adults had a mental health disorder in the UK uh, within an, any week. And we're still not properly sorted out what sort of genes and what mechanisms are involved um, in this. Certainly the HPA axis, which has already been described to you, is um, a major um, mechanism underlying stress regulation. So basically you have the hypothalamus, which produces some neuropeptides, particularly vasopressin, um, CRH, which then act at the adrenal cortex to release ACTH, and, um, um, sorry, act at pituitary to release ACH and at the adrenal cortex to release um, cortisol. And cortisol basically feeds back, inhibits through glucocorticoid receptors at every level um, of this as well. So you will um, stimulate through various stressors your HPAX system to, to work. Yeah, sorry, that's a stressor for me. Not for my wife, but for me. Um, and you, your system will obviously kick in straight away, even before you've got a chance to react, thinking it's a silly stress, it's not going to do anything um, to me. So what happens is then is that your cortisol will increase and it will feed back and it will inhibit, inhibit and stop the HP axis system from working and reduce your levels of stress. So you're not going to spend the rest of the day with a high level of stress because you've seen a spider in the bathtub. But of course there are other stresses that can mount up such as chronic stresses, where you may start to get um, increasing numbers of stresses during the day, small stresses that will mount up, and this can develop into chronic stress. Obviously, acute stresses are good. We, we need them. We have to react. Chronic stresses can be considered bad, and this can lead to long-term activation of your stress systems, which can then associate with mental health disorders, such as depression, for example. And this can also associate with the um, functioning of your HP axis as well. Generally, often, you'll find that the cortisol is less able to um, inhibit, less able to negatively feed back and stop the HP axis system. And that's found in many mental health disorders. So this brings on to the question then, is why do individuals respond differently to the stress and why do some individuals develop mental health um, disorders? So what are the differences between these individuals? Could it be genetics? Could it be uh, environment? So to, first of all, to test, the, um, test this, we can go into animal, into animal models. So you can generate different animal models, rodents, even, even insects and fish. And we can develop these different models that we can test with different paradigms, early life stresses, for example, later life stresses, various other challenges. And we can test through various psychiatric-based tests, such as the poor salt test we heard about for, for depression, various anxiety-related tests, cognitive tests. We've also got the option of transgenic animals now, as Crelox, all this CRISPR as well. 
and selective breeding as well. All these things we can do in animals that, of course, we can't do in humans. So when I very first started my, um, my PhD some time ago, this was part of that work, it was possible to selectively breed for anxiety and depression. So you take a, um, a group of, of mice and, and rats and you, s you test them all, you, you find out which of those are, are more depressive-like behaviour, which show less depressive-like behaviour. You breed them together and in only a few generations you can actually have distinct lines of low and high anxiety depressive-like behaviour. So there's something genetic within these animals and they are born basically to have this innate and depressive-like behaviour. So after only a few generations you can generate that. So showing that there are genes involved in, in, these, uh, in these disorders. Looking at that, looking at the rat, for example, and in the mouse, you can look for polymorphisms, you can look for um, throughout the genome, certain regions that associate with this depression and like behaviour, and there we're able to find that polymorphisms in the rat, in the vasopressin, which inhibited um, um, levels of vasopressin, which is important in driving the HPA axis, like I said, and also in the mouse um, as well, where there was a mutation in the actual peptide itself. But not everybody, not all of depression can be directly related to, 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 um, to genetics. So a lot of the genetic studies haven't been able to hit on key genes which can describe all of the, explain all of the depression that, that, um, that we have in society. This brings us back to the, uh, the idea about the environment as well. That some people develop depression and anxiety-related disorders because they have had adverse environmental um, exposures. This comes on to the idea about um, adaption. So the whole idea is that early in life could be an adaptive um, period whereby your environment, such as stress, is able to program endocrine circuits on the assumption that that new endocrine phenotype, which is programmed during early life, best adapts you to, to later life. And we've heard about the Uranda genocide, we've heard about a number of other cohorts, where you've got children who have high levels of adversity who have then programmed a new endocrine phenotype probably to expect high levels of stress um, as well. So with this then, you may have a good adaptative response and you may have a maladaptative response. So perhaps in a good adaptative response, and probably in our society, we've had very little severe stresses and we have relatively little stresses later on in life and we are well adapted. Some children, though, may have suffered adversity, neglect, and various other um, things during early life, and they may have a system which is programmed for high levels of stress, which in a later environment with low levels of stress could program for mental health, dis mental health um, disorders. So we wanted to test this in an animal model. So what he did was he tested early life stress, the idea that it would epigenetically program the expression of key genes regulating stress, particularly in the HPA axis. So if you take um, some mouse um, pups and you, you challenge them, you separate them from the mother for the first few um, um, weeks of, of life for uh, a couple of hours, two to three hours each day, these mice basically show depressive-like behaviour later on in adulthood. They show dysregulation of the HPA axis, they show this inhibited um, negative feedback inhibition, they're not able to shut off the HPA axis, they show various um, depressive and anxiety-like and phenotypes in tests as well. And this persists throughout for adulthood. Importantly, as well as all the cortisol differences as well and ACTH differences, they show changes in vasopressin expression differences within a small um, number of neurons, the PVN in hypothalamus, which is important in regulating the HP axis here. So in early life stress, we show the high levels of expression um, here. Then looking at that region, there's an enhancer region downstream for the vasopressin gene. If you look in adulthood, we can see those animals had the early life stress, show reduced levels of methylation within this enhancer. And this correlates with increased levels of vasopressin expression and increased levels of vasopressin peptide, which is driving the whole HPA axis. If you use a receptor antagonist against vasopressin, you can normalise the animal's behaviour completely. You also look, if you're seeing what proteins are binding there, a particular protein called MECP2, which binds to methylated DNA. This binds less in the early life stress because there is less methylation here, and it binds more in the control animals. Now, if you go to the early um, 
time point when the stress is happening, the uh, early postnatal life, we can see that methylation is no longer different in these animals. So it doesn't start out different. And during the early life exposure, methylation does not differ. But we have different levels of binding of the MECP2. So methylation doesn't differ, but MECP2 differs in its binding. What you find is MECP2 during early life can become phosphorylated, and that stops the MECP2 from binding that. So it's phosphorylated through chromogenic kinase 2, which can be activated through calcium depolarization. So the whole idea is that within the neurons, to show those neurons are stimulated by the early life stress, within those particular neurons of the PVN, that stimulation activates chromogenic kinase 2, which phosphorylates MECP2 and stops that from binding at the um, vasopressin enhancer. Later on, the idea is that the MECP2, if it's not bound here, is not able to recruit the methylation. And that's what went on further to, to test. So we've got MECP2 binding here during early life. How is it recruiting the DNA methylation and the long-lasting epigenetic regulation? And how is it recruited here in the first place? It could have picked anywhere else in the genome to bind. Why did it choose the vasopressin enhancer? So by looking at embryonic stem cell line, which is able to differentiate into PVN-like uh, neurons expressing vasopressin, and also looking at very early um, prenatal and very early postnatal um, mouse pups, we can start to look using CHIP to see what's binding and also look at the expression. So MECP2 particularly becomes more expressed during early postnatal life from days two to days, the first two weeks, becomes very highly expressed and then it drops again. And we can see that MECP2 here actually associates with the HDACs and the DNMTs, which have already been uh, explained. And these DNMTs then recruit the DNA methylation here, which then is maintained later in adulthood, together with various repressive um, chromatin marks, which I won't bore you with. Um, but then how is MECP2 then recruited to this enhancer itself? So going back in time to very early um, hypothalamic development. We don't have MECP2 binding here anymore, but we have a polycomb protein, SAS12, and that's relatively more specific um, than MECP2, and that enhancer region is a, um, it's a particular region that recruits um, SAS12 and polycomb. This also then binds together with TEP1, and you find a doxy um, CPG methylation um, here. So her idea is that early in life, you get the polycomb, which recruits MECP2, MECP2 can be phosphorylated by, um, by early life stress, and depending on that early life stress and the phosphorylation, whether it is able to maintain and um, develop the DNA methylation needed to control vasopressin expression and the HPA axis and depressive flight behaviour later on. So why is this important to work out the mechanism of all of these little actors in, in, this, in, 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 in this stage? So, for example, polycomb is important at this region, involved in recruiting MECP2, doesn't seem to recruit directly, there seems to be something in between MECP2 and SAS12, which I haven't quite been able to work out yet. Um, but if you disturb polycomb binding, you can knock it down with this drug um, DZNEP. In vitro, we didn't, haven't done it in vivo yet. You reduce polycomb binding here, it stops MECP2 being recruited, and so you alter later life vasopressin expression in these, in these neurons. You can also target HDACs, particularly like valproic acid, where in vitro and in vivo studies show that valproic acid um, regulates vasopressin expression. Fibrocytidine for the DNMTs. You've also got bisphenol A, which also acts as DNMTs. And all of these compounds individually um, alter vasopressin expression in vivo and in vitro. So the idea is that working out this pathway will allow us to, to target particular, particular genes. So... Going on for um, um, the further studies then, it's the other finding that you have um, people who have high risk of depression often associate with depression and depressed parents, not always genetically, but the idea is that um, uh, maternal depression can associate with increased risk of developing depression mood disorders in children um, as well. So that's something along the lines of basically the inheritance of acquired um, acquired traits, the multi-generational, transgenerational, cross-generational um, 
uh, ideas. So the idea is that if you have a, a mother or even a father who has had a stress, you can program stress changes in further generations. This could be through epigenetic changes that we've, um, we've, we've heard about. These could be through behavioural changes that you may alter the behaviour of a parent who then passes on that, that behaviour. This could be through endocrine and or immune changes. These could be also this lactocrine programme as, as well. They may have alterations in, in the milk um, through, through stress that could be passed on to, to the offspring as well. So the epigenetic, particularly this, the idea about the intergenerational epigenetic programming, is when you, have, you stress a mother who, who, who is pregnant, she's basically carrying her F2 um, cells um, within her. So she will have um, um, a fetus who is then carrying the next generation of, of gametes. So basically the stress can hit all three um, generations at, at the same time. And there's a lot of evidence to support that and there's been a number of animal models to support that this happens. Of course, this doesn't explain the, the F3, which is that magical um, F generation that people are trying, um, are definitely, desperately um, are trying to reach. And it's basically, it's through the, the proper transgenerational um, um, epigenetics. The transgenerational could possibly explain the F3. If you get an alteration in the gamete that is then propagated into further gametes, that irrespective of the of the behaviour of the of the parents, you can get this pure epigenetic um, transgenerational inheritance. Studies for this are, are relatively few and far between, but I know this field is is is, is rapidly gaining interest. One study, for example, with uh, DS and Resolent a few years ago. Uh, looking at shock and, and, and um, odour, we're able to programme differences in methylation within the sperm cells of the father that were able then to actually programme changes in startle response in the, in the F2 gen generation, um, showing that it's possible possibly that, that gametes could be affected by, um, by stress. That could be one mechanism for transgenerational inheritance of, of stress. I've been doing a little bit of work with it, not so much really. I work with someone in the in IVF clinic where you have a lot of sperm samples, a um, hundred or, or more, and we're looking at sort of stress, um, stress um, in um, this quite detailed um, questionnaire that they fill in, looking at glucortical receptor and stuff, but I never really found, um, found anything. Although we find stuff with diets and stuff as well, but not actually with, with particular stress. The... Um, the other option and the other, other mechanism, possibly working together, would be the idea about, uh, about behaviour. That if you stress a mother, you could alter her behaviour, and that behaviour could be learned and passed on to the F1, possibly F2, that you can actually learn a, 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 a behaviour. So to do this then, we've established this uh, together with um, Dr Ben Nephew at Tufts University. This chronic social stress um, uh, model what we do is we, we stress the, the mother when she's got her, her pups through a resonant intruder. Um, don't feel sorry for the mother because the resonant intruder, this male, is a lot smaller than the mother and generally just gets beaten and um, doesn't have a great hour of it. And so basically, but it's, it's a pure psychosocial stress to, to the mother. She's very stressed having this, um, this male intruder in the cage. And, and then what we do is we look at the maternal care. We then take the pups then they become dams themselves. We look at their levels of maternal care and we take their pups and look at their levels of maternal care as well. So by doing this, our first sort of hypotheses were that we may see changes in maternal care, but then after generations, these basically dissipate. It turns back to normal again. And if you look at the FO, at day two, this is when the first paradigm is first started, you're not expecting to see any, any differences. You see normal levels of maternal care, normal levels of, of basically um, maternal anxiety and restlessness behaviour. At day nine, this um, levels of maternal care um, drop. So the mother's <coughs> trying to adapt to this stressor. But then at day 16, it normalises again. So the mothers are able to adapt well and actually normalise levels of maternal care towards the end of the gestational period. In the F1, these pups that have been exposed to level of reducing level of maternal care at day nine they start off with reduced levels of maternal care at day two, but then they normalise again, day nine and day 16. So again, they adapt to one. Now when we come to the F2s, it doesn't disappear at all, but it becomes exaggerated. At day twos, at um, the F2s, day two, day nine, day 16, 
you have a, a, a reduced levels of maternal care through all the gestational time period. So basically what you have is you have this persistence of maternal care throughout the gestational time period. So with only within the FO generation, you're able to reduce gross changes in maternal, maternal care quite sort of quickly. And that associates, again, you get the same picture of maternal restlessness um, as well. Maternal aggression goes the opposite way. And so what happens is you're able to completely program maternal care very, very, very uh, quickly. Looking at gene regulation, we see big changes in the FO and the F1 in vasopressin and many of the candidates involved in HP access and maternal care. But in the F2, it's basically normalised. So they seem to be so relatively normal. We don't see any difference in oxytocin differences that we also saw in the F1 and F2. We get a relatively normal endocrine system, but it's at a reduced levels of maternal care. Looking at milk production, in the FO, milk levels itself are, are reduced, corresponding to some of the levels of ma maternal care, and also known that stress can reduce um, la lactation, and so the levels of milk production are, are reduced here. In the F1, it's um, relatively similar, a slight difference in, in, in milk production, and in the F2, it's completely normal. They don't differ in any, even though they show lower levels of maternal care, the levels of milk production that the pups get is, is, is the same. Looking at milk corticosterone, we see no differences in the FO, and in the F1, we don't see any differences. However, there's reduced levels of corticosterone in the milk in, in the F2. So they're somehow adapting in this, in this F2 generation. Now, if you look at the serum corticosterone, the mothers in the FO actually don't show any difference in corticosterone, which is quite surprising, following the stress and following the uh, relative uh, depression in maternal care. But again, they adapt quite well, so this may well, may well uh, reflect that. In the F1, we see the increased levels of corticosterone, which we might expect following stress. When you get stressed, increased corticosterone obviously um, increase, and that's throughout. When you come to the F2, though, that's completely turned on its head. We have this hypocorticosteronism in the adults, males and females, and in the dams as well. We get this massive reduction of, 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 of cortisol production. This is associated recently with some, um, some PTSD studies, and the idea is that it's associated also with levels of chronic stress that the endocrine system actually adapts and actually tries to reduce the levels of cortisol to actually protect, um, protect itself. Looking at um, glucocorticoid uh, receptor, we see some differences in uh, glucocorticoid receptor methylation as well, the usual sort of um, candidates there, and also in the, in the hippocampus as well. Um, however, in the F2, these are relatively normalised. So many of the aspects of the endocrine system, except the, except the hypercorticalism, hypercorticalism is, is, um, is normalised, um, except that they've got reduced levels of maternal, maternal care. Then we've been looking at some immune markers. So we've been looking at um, what sort of immune effects could be, could be involved. So it looks at a big panel of, of immune, immune markers in the in the F2 adults, males and females, and we found some differences in interferon gamma inter and a few interleukins, and particularly this one, ICAM-1, probably come back to the NCAM we've just been hearing about, um, ICAM-1 stood out as well, which is quite interesting, and you've just heard about all the background for ICAM-1, which is NCAM-1, which is a, which is a similar family to the, to the ICAM-1. We see reduced levels, and also in the, the dams as well, we see reduced levels of ICAM-1. We go back to the F1, it's not, it's not significant, and the FO, it's, it's, no, it's no difference um, at all. So we do seem to see some immune changes, even though many of the endocrine changes aren't that changed. Um, so what we're doing now is trying to work out the mechanisms behind this. So what we can do is we can give intranasal uh, vasopressin and, and oxytocin, and we can normalise some of the behaviour, um, the idea that these two... Um, Neuropeptides could be heavily involved, but it doesn't actually normalise some of the interferon gamma stuff uh, we see as well. So we're still trying to work out the mechanisms um, linking the immune changes to the changes we see in, in maternal, maternal care. So coming to the, um, to, um, the, um, the rat models, particularly it's always difficult to go through any presentation without the slide of, of, of Michael Meany and, and, and Reva. Um, the, the sort of the um, study that found a lot of this, of this field about the glucocorticoid receptor. So the idea that high levels of, of lichen and grooming in maternal care um, modulate um, DNA methylation at the glucocorticoid receptor. And we've shown some of that in, in our model as well in the F1 generation. This has led obviously to lots of human studies. 
translated out to lots and lots of human studies looking at, at leukocytes and a few studies looking in the brain around the same region um, as well, looking at maternal depression and um, childhood responses and early life um, stresses. So we've also been looking at this in a study we've got called the Real Child Health and Development Study. So the Real is the part of Liverpool, this little peninsula pokes out near Liverpool, and the red and blue are differences in socio-economic scales. So we have a, vi a wide variety of socio-economic differences um, within this, in this population. So the MRC, we've basically been uh, sponsored this basically since, um, since very early pregnancy, and the children are now nine years old. That we have 1,200 mothers that are brought in to, um, to clinic. And what we've been doing is we've been measuring all their environmental factors and we've been measuring the children's behaviour and maternal behaviour. So these are very detailed um, environmental pictures that we have of, of, these, of these children. So what we wanted to do then is to extrapolate some of the work from the Micromenia study and look at stroking. Does that work in, in, in um, infants? And so what we did is we looked at... Um, um, postnatal depression, and the idea is that postnatal depression uh, associates with um, child um, behaviour, ne negative behaviour, or negative depression-like behaviour. However, in those mothers that showed high levels of maternal stroking, and this was a self-reported questionnaire, how often you stroke your children, some 34% um, like never, and um, some like yes, lots, and you saw that those that sh um, sh stroke the children uh, more actually was able to reduce the negative impact of maternal depression on those, those children. This ties into some of the fantastic work with um, Francis McLaurin and Susan Walker at uh, Liverpool John Moores. And they've been able to show that this touch actually has a neurochemical um, 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 system involved. So these neurons, these C-tactile efferent neurons within the skin. So you have these, these neurons within particularly the, the hairy skin of, of the, your head and, and your arms, and these particular neurons will react to, to stroking, depending on the environmental cue. So you can actually have good environmental cues with nice pictures, or you can have a bad environmental cue with an awful spy or something, and you'll react differently depending on that. But these neurons are highly sensitive to, 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 um, um, to stroke. And even shown that it can actually induce um, oxytocin um, as well. So nice levels of stroking actually introduce oxytocin. And that's how we think the mechanism is working with, with the children. That the early stroking um, in, in, in early life, in early life um, weeks 9 and, and 18, actually are able to, um, to do this. So we had to then test further the Micromenia hypothesis about the stroking and glucocorticoid receptor methylation. And so we looked at the, um, the same region that's been described uh, as well, at 14 months in the children, and we've also been looking at... So these children also have sequential DNA collections. So we have DNA every one and a half years from these, from these children. So we have a nice longitudinal picture, epigenetic picture of, of, these, of these children. So just looking at 14 months... We looked at these two CPG sites here. They're always different numbers in different people's presentations. But there was this um, meta-analysis by Palmer um, Gurdiel, and she found the CPG 35 and 36 were the most responsive and most associated with levels of maternal depression and, and children behavior, child behaviour. And so we looked particularly at, at these. And we found that methylation was predicted by prenatal depression and it was predicted by postnatal depression, which has previously been, been shown, quite, quite, quite a few studies, like Oberlander study, for example. And so quite a lot of studies have shown this. But of course, it's a stroking. And if you looked at the stroking, particularly in those children exposed to prenatal um, non-depression and, and postnatal depression, which I'll explain in the next slide, stroking actually reduced associated with a reduction in that level of methylation. So the increased stroking associated with reduction in methylation, very similar to, um, to the rat studies um, that, that sh I showed you. We then wanted to look at the predictive adaptive response. Um, uh, so we'll go back into the, um, into the Daphne um, again, but that was nicely explained. This whole idea, adapt, um, whole idea about um, adaptation, the idea is that you respond to your environmental cue by establishing something that you don't quite need right now, but you will predict you will need in a later environment, just like the helmets on the, um, on the Daphne. So this is well known and it's been associated, for example, with, with, with early, early diet and obesity, for, for example. The idea is that the prenatal will um, establish um, or program certain uh, genes to um, expect changes um, that environment to persist later in life. Of course, the problem is, is that when you get this um, 
uh, mismatch. So you've got a, an environment here and that you've programmed your systems to, um, to um, better react to and that your environment has differed later on. And this is mismatch that's probably underlying a lot of, of, of mental health disorders, a lot of disorders that we have today. What we wanted to test was whether you can bring this forward. Rather than later life, is there a prenatal and postnatal adaptation? So can you actually see whether you've actually adapted prenatally to the early postnatal? So that's what we've, we tested. And we could see that if you associated with, with, with childhood um, outcome, we can see that the, um, where they had the no prenatal depression here, if you had increased levels of postnatal depression, which is here, you showed increased levels of DNA methylation. Whereas if you had prenatal depression and then you had postnatal depression, there was no association with methylation anymore. And it's exactly the same as the behaviour. So those children who had the prenatal depression and the postnatal depression, at the prenatal depression, no longer reacted to the postnatal depression with changes in behaviour. Those children that didn't have the prenatal depression, in response to postnatal depression, were highly sensitive to postnatal depression and developed um, negative outcomes in the behaviour. So exactly the same picture we see with, with the methylation. So those children that are more sensitive to changes in methylation, postnatal depression, didn't have the prenatal depression. So the whole idea is that the prenatal depression buffers against the postnatal depression. Now we've been looking at the idea about sex differences in the prenatal and postnatal depression. There's this old theory, this um, Trivers-Willard hypothesis, where there's an idea that a good conditioned mother will transfer competitive ability to male offspring for greater reproductive output. The idea is that a poorer male will out, um, a poorer female will out uh, compete a poorer male. Um, so females are more guaranteed of, of producing further offspring than a poor, a poor male who's not able to compete against, against other males. So the idea is that the, the females under, under, under stress, the, the female children under stress should respond better to a, a, a mother who's un, under stress. And by looking at that, we can see this prenatal postnatal mismatch. It's particularly the, the girls. So the boys, irrelevant of they had the prenatal depression or not, in response to postnatal depression, still show um, negative um, um, outputs in, 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 um, in behaviour. So they still respond to postnatal depression in, in behaviour. But those children who had the prenatal stress, in response to postnatal stress, there's no longer that increase anymore. In fact, it actually protects to some degree. So if it's prenatal depression, you're actually having a protective effect from the postnatal depression um, um, here. It's actually better in some ways, I guess, to have the prenatal depression. And you see the same difference in, in, in methylation. So, for example, in the, um, those children without the, the goes girls without the prenatal um, depression, in response to postnatal depression, showed this big increase in DNA methylation. Whereas if those girls had, had, had been exposed to prenatal depression, postnatal depression had no more influence on DNA methylation here. They're basically, sensor, sen they're basically um, immune to that. So all of these studies make fantastic ideas to go back to the animal model again. So of course there's things that we can't test in the children any more than we have done. And of course you want to develop further hypotheses to go back to the, to, to, to the children again. So what we've been doing is developing this animal model, developing, developing the, um, the um, um, application for it, which is still under um, review, is we can do is we can do the prenatal and postnatal animal model. So the idea is that you can have um, no stress prenatally and postnatally. You can stress a, 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 um, a mother, a pregnant mother, um, prenatally and then reduce the stress postnatally. So there's no stress postnatally. You can do it the other way around where we've got the postnatal stress. We've got no postnatal stress, but only, only no prenatal stress, only the postnatal stress. And we can do pre and postnatal. The idea is that we'll do the stress and we'll cross foster here to stop any carryover from the prenatal stress. And the whole idea is here, we should hopefully find the same, I same findings here, that these mice in particular should show the most um, um, negative outcomes in response to um, depressive-like behaviour. Of course, then, you need to test the males and females to see if you find exactly the same things that we find in, in, in the human studies that we've been looking at. And, of course, the aspect of stroking. Is it possible that stroking has a bigger effect on those that are more sensitive to the um, um, more expensive, sensitive to the stressor. As we showed, those with the prenatal, no prenatal stress, but only postnatal stress, are more sensitive to the effects of the stroking. This is something we're going to, to test um, as well. 
And hopefully when you find these out, and we can obviously take the brains from these animals, we can try and work out more of the mechanisms, then we can go back to the children to test key, key, um, key uh, pathways. Then looking back into the human um, cohorts, it's quite clear that not everyone with early life stress develops uh, depression. And not everyone with depression suffered early life stress. It's not as, as simple um, as that. There's obviously other mechanisms at play uh, as well. This comes to the gene environment in interactions. This is the fantastic paper by, by Caspi and et al. Um, Institute, Institute of Psychiatry. Where if you've got an allele, for example, for the Myo A gene, and it's the low activity, you have a low antisocial um, behaviour. However, if you've been exposed to severe childhood maltreatment and that allele, certainly then you have a greater increased risk of, of showing uh, antisocial behaviour. So basically the allele is only half the story. It depends on what gene you've got and then the environment you're, you're exposed to, all this G by E in interactions. So this would be interesting to do, particularly go back to the animal models to test this, which is what um, I'm doing, my uh, next application that's, that's in, is looking at mouse strains in which you can look for genome ride for particular regions that could actually be, be, um, be uh, regulating this. So the recombinant inbred mouse strains are a fantastic model to, to do this. So what they've done is that if you've, you've crossed a um, C57 with a, a D DBA, you have the F1, and you cross these to F2s, and you pure breed the F2s. You've got a number of mice, and in 60, that are all pure breeding for a different genetic background. Each has a different genetic background, pure breeding for that. So what you could do then is do QTL uh, an analysis on that. You could look, for example, the length of a tail, for example, and you can see that maybe BXD2 and BXD5 have a, a longer tail, and they also share this bit of the region here, uh, for example. But you can go to something more interesting and then look at sort of depressive anxiety-related behaviour. Which animals are the most depressed and which animals are most, most anxious? And to see which share these particular parts of, of the genome to do a particular, you know, a characteristic, a typical QTL uh, analysis. So by doing that then, looking at all the genetic variability, you can test for depressive like behaviour and see which are the highest stressed and which parts of the genome they particularly uh, share. So if you could do this, for example, for the tail suspension test and the open field, and there's a few other tests, lots of tests that are available for this, you can see that in this area, there's particularly chromosome 2, for example, where you've got a particular gene region of the genome which associates with response to tail suspension and open field behaviour here. So there's something in this region here, um, there's something genetic in this region here that associates with, um, with response to these two tests. So look a bit closer, we can see particularly this uh, region here, 140 megabases, 160 megabases. And you can take that region and we've done um, genome-wide uh, methylation on this. And you can see which regions there have showed different levels of methylation and if that associates possibly with a gene that could be important in regulating um, that, um, that behaviour. So by doing this, you can see a few regions are, are relatively shared between these, these strains, and there's a few regions that sort of stand out that there are different levels of methylation in there. And if you look closely at here, picking one example for this, there's this um, region here that associates with the somatostatin um, receptor subtype 4, where there is an extra bit of methylation here. And if you look at there, on that region, we zoom in again, that bit of methylation here, we can see differs. And that that's directly over an enhancer region of this promoter, which is known to regulate it. And then we can look at polymorphisms. What's the difference between these strains? That's governing the difference we see in the, in the tail suspension test. So there's a number of polymorphisms here. Ignore a lot of these. A lot of these are between all the mouse strains. And so a few of them are only significant between the C57 and DB8. And one of them that is basically lies here directly within the enhancer region. So the idea is that we've got a polymorphism here within an enhancer region that's differently methylated that may be important in governing methylation at this region and in regulating somatostatin receptor 4. And a couple of recent papers have shown if you delete somatostatin 4, you knock it out, you actually get anxiety depressive like behaviour in the animals um, as well. This is a fantastic tool to be able to work out in a, a genome-wide scale 
um, how, how, this, um, how you can um, find genes involved in, in best like behaviour. The key thing that I'm doing at the moment, which we've got a, um, a grant in at the moment, would be to add an early life stressor into that. <coughs> and then that would be a gene that predicts response to early life stressor um, um, to develop depressive like behaviour as well. So, um, so yeah, basically, so um, hopefully showing you some of the ideas that we can do is you can, if you, if you see differences within, um, within the human populations that you can try and model animal models to test these hypotheses and back again, even things like stroking, for example, that comes directly from the animal studies, you can actually translate back to the human as well. It's not just a one-way system, it can actually um, perpetuate, and that's the whole idea, is to bounce ideas off, off the human to the animal studies. I'd like to thank the Real Child Health and Development Study, um, Jonathan Hill, um, um, Helen Sharp, Andrew Pickles, John Quinn, um, University of Liverpool, University of Reading, King's College, Ben Nephew at Tufts um, University, uh, the Max Planck, from which some of this work was, was done, and some of my members in my lab at Manchester Metropolitan University. Thank you. If there's any questions. So thank you very much, Chris. I think you just perfectly explained why we are all here today because of this back and forth between animal models and humans. Yeah. One don't go without the other, actually. Um, yes, super nice talk. And I think The stroking behavior, you're referring to licking behavior, right? Licking and grooming behavior, yes. Grooming and licking stuff. Okay. Just wanted to, because I was trying to picture, I'm like, wait a second, stroking the mice, is that stroking? Yeah, you've, you've, you've hit on the question, which is, what is the licking and grooming for? You can have the, the nice um, romantic idea that it's, that's the mother that's, that's just looking at their children, or the other idea that actually helps to move bowel movements as well. So you have this androgenital licking and grooming as well. So how you, um, whether it's a combination of, of both that the, the animals are, are responding to. And my second question is, in the QTL analyses of the behaviors, was those the only two behaviors that you recorded or were there? This is actually data that's, that's available on, um, on the BXD, um, BXD website. There's a whole, whole website that a lot of people be looking at different BXD strains, and you basically add them, add, add them all, to, all together. So there's a few other different behaviours as well. There's some various memory behaviours um, as well. I just picked those two because that's what I'm particularly looking at at the moment. Yeah, well, thank you for that really exciting data. The um, depressive patients that we see, uh, if we look at them in terms of whether they have experienced childhood adversities or have had a good childhood, we cannot see a difference in their clinical symptom profile yeah. in terms of uh, sleeping patterns, uh, nutrition, whatever, behavior, yeah. sadness. They show exactly the same pattern. However, if we treat them, we will see that those who have been at childhood adversities are much more difficult to treat. Basically, they are not responding to any first-line treatment, okay. be it psychopharmacological, be it behavioral. It's much easier to treat someone uh, who has not had this childhood adversity. So basically the behavioral activation, you give them a hug, I mean depression in the end is a way of social defeat or response to social defeat yeah. in terms of submissive behavior. That does not work in uh, those with childhood uh, adversities. And I wonder, so whether that's really the same. Maybe <coughs> they look in terms of their uh, phenotype a little bit similar, yeah. but these are completely different disorders. Yeah, M maybe that's one way you could you could actually categorize. So do you have any, uh, you know, um, have you ever looked at this difference? You said you've, you've only investigated the consequences of childhood adversities. Yes. You also had mice that are depressed without... Uh, yes, those, those, were, um, those were genetically um, um, depressed. They're basically um, innate anxiety, depression. Um, nothing really to do you could do with them. They all responded to a vasopressin receptor antagonist, which doesn't work in, in a clinic. Um, but maybe there's a difference between genetic, more genetic levels of depression and more de epigenetic environmental depression. Maybe, maybe there are differences. Those people who are maybe born with certain genetic makeup more increases their vulnerability to depression, maybe those are different responders to 
those who've adapted. You could basically make a mouse helpless, right? You couldn't take away the job, I see that, but uh, you, could, you could expose her to an environmental condition yes. that makes her more... You have this, like, this you have the restraint stresses and stuff, yeah. And it would be that. really different, different situation. That would be interesting to look at. Yeah. And you've shown so the results, the results until the F2 generation? Yes. Until that, you also mentioned those starting in F3 or what? Yes, I know. Still arguing with Ben, nephew at Tufts to get the F3. So yes, we're, we're doing this at the moment. It's the F3, that's the exciting one. We didn't expect it to go much to the F2, to be honest with you. We thought, oh, OK, it's going to probably dissipate the interest in the F1. But then the F2 is just, and so yeah. So we're, we're repeating the experiment and we're, we're going to the F, F3. That is the, um, that is the big one. Hopefully, predicting that's going to be very strong as well, and hopefully, you're going to maintain that. So, instead of breeding for um, the depressive anxiety about behavior, starting a PhD, you can actually um, adapt them for that. And within only a few generations, you've actually got a very different animal just from an environmental exposure. Mm.